Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studios here in the heart of Lincoln Center. I want to introduce uh, the star of stage and screen. She's recognized by all. She's Elizabeth Ashley. She's uh, in uh, You Can't Take It With You with James Earl Jones. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Did you just tell me before you got in there you love PBS? Oh, God, yes. I mean, we were saying, you know, how it takes, you know, it takes time to scroll the sponsors and everything. And I mean, my response to that is anything, anything that keeps PBS on the air and going is, uh, I mean, get like being kissed on the butt by God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just please, please keep it up. We're going to use that, you know. Oh, yeah? The next pledge drive. Hey, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, earlier today, because we are taping here at our uh, Tish WNAT, studio and we, we tape a whole range of people in a day. We had Scott Ellis, your director, oh. and you just said, you gave me that reaction. You said, oh, what makes him a great director? I, I think Scott Ellis is old school in the best possible way. Number one, he knows what he wants. I mean, he's warm and witty and funny and personable, and he creates an atmosphere mm. where actors are totally comfortable. Someone once asked, Meryl Streep, what she most wanted in a director, and she gave the best answer I've ever heard. She said, confidence. He's got an eye for detail, for the detail that tells the story, because he's about telling the story, and he comes in knowing the story he wants to tell. Tell the story, uh, Elizabeth, tell us a little bit, if you could, about this story, this play. What makes this play special, and then talk about your role. Well. This play was done in 1936, and... You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. And that was the, the depth of the Depression. We were on the brink of World War. And in so many ways, the period in which this play was done parallels the period that we're in now. Mm. And it was... It was... An, when it was done, I think it would have been the equivalent of what we think of as early Neil Simon. It would have been just a gag fest in the best possible way, when people needed to laugh and sure. feel good. And it is very subtly, uh, it takes on class, it takes on capitalism, it takes on the government, and but it, it in a very warm, witty, outrageously funny way without a drop of sentimentality. No sentimentality. None but, but, whatsoever. But you're the Grand Duchess. Isn't there any oh, sentimentality there? Not a bit. Not, nothing? Oh, not a bit of it. No, 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 no. What Look, we're looking at that. Yes, but, oh, please. Oh, there's not a drop of sentimentality <laughs> there. No, What's she all about? Well, because at that period, because even when I first came to New York, uh, like in 1958, right, I mean, doormen and waitresses, they were all like Russian immigrants, you know? And, uh, and I mean, and they, of course, they would all, if you got to talking to them, tell you how, oh, they were related to the czar and this and that. They all came from something very grand and would be... How, Iffy, right? I mean, she is just one, in the the way Kaufman and Hart tell their story. I mean, it is it is first and foremost a story of family, right? right. A, a family of nonconformists, of uh, a bohemian kind of existence uh, that is that stands opposed to conformity and sort of uh, the the sheep headset of society, and. Into this household come a variety of characters, many of whom have just sort of lived there, right? They just sort of move in. But along the way, they bring it, they're like vignettes, they're like cameos of people that pass through the lives of this family. And one of the characters in the play is a, 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 a very a very bad ballet dancer, but she doesn't see it that way. And she has a Russian immigrant ballet teacher who has a friend who is a Russian grand duchess, cousin to the czar, who who is a is waitress. That it right there? Yes. No, that's yes, that's the wonderful Annalie Ashman who plays Essie. And uh, she's a she longs to be a great ballerina. But she's not great. No, she has no talent whatsoever. <laughs> she's just 
awful. And, and James Earl, um, John he, plays... He plays the grandfather. He is... He's there the he one... Oh, God. I mean, Fabulous? Oh. What's well, he like to work he's with? A, he's, he's a cultural icon. He was the only person in the play that I'd ever worked with before in The Best Man. And, I mean, James Earl Jones is... He's a national treasure. Mm. And he's a great actor. He's a magnificent man. And he's in this part, because we think of James playing, the, I mean, the sort of extremely deep, dark, and there's nothing he can't play. But you've never seen him the way you see him in this play, you know? He's, let, me, let me do this, because um, there's so many parts of your career that are so fascinating. Um, Cat on a Hot Tim Roof. Many know you for that. I say that, what comes to your mind? Tennessee Williams. Big part of your life. Oh, yes. Well, I grew up uh, sort of uh, borderline poor in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, I mean, I, my parent, I, I was the child of divorce. I lived with my mother. And then in the 40s and the 50s, I mean, that was not normal. You know, and uh, my mother did everything that she could to broaden my mind and try and make me aware that there was a world of ideas. And Baton Rouge, Louisiana is where uh, the university is. And so she took me to every play that LSU did, whether they did it well or not was not the point. You were but, going. Uh, oh, yes. Going. And when I was about nine or ten, she took me to see Summer and Smoke, and some penny dropped in my head because it was the first time that I realized that I was seeing people on a stage saying and doing things that were going on in my house, in my world, but that were the secrets, the taboos, the things that nobody talked about. There were, it was the like, don't let the neighbors know, don't, don't even, you pretend it's not happening, whatever. Were you hooked immediately? On, and Tennessee on, Williams wrote that. Yes. Were you hooked immediately? Well, on Tennessee Williams, yes. Then I wanted to see and read everything of his that I could. And I think that probably had a lot to do with my becoming an actress because it was a world where the the unsayable could be said, where the the ideas that were heretical or taboo, the the underbelly of 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 your world could be a, could be shown in the light and could be thought about and talked about. And that's what appealed to me. I think I've always been a little bit of a heretic. I think it's in the DNA. Maybe it's being Southern, I don't know. And then, so when, I mean, my career, I was, I've been counted dead down over with and finished so many times because- Career-wise? Oh, sure. And just keep coming back? Well, yeah, but I mean, mainly, I mean, because I had, I'd had, I was one of those people that was cursed, blessed by becoming very sort of successful, sort of celebrated. Basically, that five minutes when you're just the newest Twinkie on the block and about five seconds and you're sort of on the cover of everything and everybody tells you how wonderful you are, you become a commodity. And of course, you believe it all. And then you find out it doesn't, not really true. And you sort of melt down, crack up, go nuts and turn into some kind of a monster. And you run away or you buy into it and it all becomes, it becomes a catastrophe one way or another. Some survive it, some don't. I quit. And then, of course, time, the time passed. I had a child, I got married, I got divorced. I had to then earn a living. And so I was desperately trying to get any kind of television job I could because there's nothing more unemployable than movie stars' ex-wives, right? Which is what I was then. And. Uh, and, and I was beginning to get television work. I got a oh phone call that uh, did I want to go to Connecticut to the American Shakespeare Festival at Stratford for like $250 a week and a barn and do a revival of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And I mean, and I, bottom line, short, making a long story short, I said yes, and I have Tuesday well to thank because they'd offered it to Tuesday, who turned it down. And you took it. Oh God! Changed yes. your life. At, well, because Tennessee was there, and they, and 
Stratford was like a rep company and it was the last show in, so we had like eight, 10 weeks of rehearsal and Tennessee was there. And what we, what it, the remarkable thing was, it was his original version. What people don't realize in 1955, when Cat on a Hot Tin Roof was first done, I mean, it was shut down for a day in Boston by federal marshals because on a moral charge. Well, because risque. Well, yes, and it dealt with homosexuality conceivably and stuff like that. And so Kazan kind of fixed it. Billy Kazan. Yes, who directed it originally. And Tennessee always had he was never satisfied because they sort of changed his ending. And so we Tennessee never had one version of anything. I mean, there are 87 versions of everything he ever wrote. And the great Michael Kahn, who was artistic director at Stratford and who directed that production, uh, unearthed. And Tennessee came with, like, bags and bags full of every version of every line he'd ever written. And, he, and, he, and Tennessee loved actors. And Tennessee was with... He just loved being in rehearsals every day. And he'd give you... Three or four different versions. He'd take the way you just read it to me. Tell me. We'll find out which one we like the best. Well, I mean, it's like a gift from God. Well, you know, I, this is the part, even in public broadcasting, where time becomes an issue, and I don't like that, even though we give more time and have more time than others. I could listen to you. I know our audience could for a long time, but do you mind if I let folks know again uh, that they can see you on uh, You Can't Take It With You, which yes. is uh, where? Where is it? It, it's at the Long Acre Theater. It's uh, 48th Street between 7th and 8th, and it's the it's the best of Broadway. It has the biggest cast of a straight play of a top of the line Broadway actors all bringing their A game, and more of them on the stage at one time than you will ever see again. Elizabeth Ashley, you honor us by being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All the best. Stay right there. Stay, Stay right with here. us. Uh, more great television uh, broadcasting here from the Tisch WNT studio at Lincoln Center. Stay with us. We'll be right back. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Meridian Health, Felician College, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Cone Resnick, Investors Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, and by the Ollendorf Center. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.